Laurie Moore has continued to delight readers with her short stories, but it has been 14 years since her last novel, the Women's Prize shortlisted A Gate at the Stairs. Her new novel, I Am Homeless If This Is Not My Home, contains dual narratives, which deal with the themes of love, loss and memory. As one of America's most distinctive voices, it's best not to try and summarise things for a pithy intro. Far better to join our conversation about literary forms, the absurdity of loss, and why romantic love is a tricky thing. I thought I would start actually by talking a bit about form before we get into the the novel itself. Um, And that's because there's something fresh in my mind because I was talking to the writer uh, Emma Klein yesterday for the podcast. Mm -hmm. And she's also somebody who has written both short stories and novels. And Mm -hmm. I was asking her about the difference for her. And she said that writing a novel can feel like you're sort of doing surgery. It's very, very labor intensive and it requires a lot of uh, attention all the rest of it. Whereas she felt that stories felt to her a bit more like acupuncture. So not not the same at all as surgery. And that she felt that they were a bit more like how life is. Does that sort of chime with you as somebody who's obviously very adept at writing in both forms? And then maybe could you tell me a bit about why this book had to be a novel rather than a story? There's, you know, people who do both stories and um, and novels have all kinds of metaphors for it. I mean, I, I might say, oh, uh, writing a short story is like swimming in a swimming pool and, and writing a novel is like swimming in the ocean, like and forever. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't you can't see the the coastline it's like very scary um so it, it it's just larger and you feel lost now people who only write novels don't feel that way i don't think and they complain that short stories are harder because they're too constricting you, they have to be quote unquote perfect mm. there's a certain looseness to a novel that that they prefer they they don't feel panicked or lost in a novel but if you do have a habit of going back and forth between these um two forms we'll call them forms they're not quite form. the short story is sort of a form and the novel sort of not um uh they're genres technically and um but we could call them structures mm. um and when you go back and forth, you uh, you you can feel a little panicked in a novel. But a novel has as its subject time, and it has as its medium time. Um, and and there's there when you have that much time going on, the short story is probably not your best approach. And you can just feel naturally what the concerns of the story you're writing are. Mm. And you can see that perhaps um, a novel is what you'll need and it will take a long time. Um, there's a stereophonic quality to a novel. You Often there's two different um, pieces of time. Mm -hmm. talking to each other two different characters sometimes talking to each other two different points of view talking to each other now there's all kinds of exceptions to this and of course Alice Munro is a total exception in the short story world because she's doing all the things novelists do but she's doing them in a in short stories but she's very unusual and her stories are quite long Mm -hmm. and ostensibly I'm told that she always began her stories thinking they would be a novel. Oh. And that's why the, her concerns are very novelistic and and she does take on time as a subject and time as a medium. Um, but that's very unusual in short story writing. And she gets to page 55 and then she's done. <laughs> so she just has these long short stories. She, you know... She has she has two books that can be called novels because they're not they're novels in in stories. Yeah. Um, but mostly she's a story writer. So um I knew I wanted these letters in this book, and I knew it would be confusing at first to go back and forth, but I thought eventually um 
a, the reader would get their bearing. This is very true. So as you say, there are these, the, the novel starts with these letters and mm -hmm. the reader isn't quite sure wh what the novel is, I suppose, at the beginning, that it might be set uh, as it appears with these letters sort of just after the American Civil War. Um, and then we find ourselves in a, a, in a modern scenario. And it's not clear why these two things are connected until much later in the novel. Um, right. I, you look as though you you quite enjoy the fact that the reader um, is is left sort of reaching for a, a handhold somewhere at the beginning. Is that part of the joy of putting this this book together? And as you say, that thing of t having the two different times speaking to each other. I did want the two different times speaking to each other. I didn't want a lot of reader confusion, but, <laughs> I, but unfortunately. For a lot of readers, there is that. In fact, my, one of my very first readers, my editor at, at Canop, said, you're going to have to explain this to me. <laughs> and some other very sympathetic readers have said to me, I was very confused at the beginning, but then I, then I wasn't. And other sy sympathetic readers have said, I had to read it twice. Mm. <laughs> and other unsympathetic readers have said, it's it's too confusing. What, what, what's going on here? Um, and they, so I, I guess I was hoping not for confusion, but for patience. Mm -hmm. And and there are other novels and other narrative fiction that require a certain amount of patience, so, so that you can see how the different um, parts come together. Um, and that's that's just what I was hoping for. But not everyone has a lot of patience. <laughs> but. <laughs> Keeping patience in mind, the book is not that long. So this is, this is true. It's the perfect length. If you did want to immediately go back to the beginning and start again, it's entirely possible to do that. Probably within well, that a would day. Be a I lot think. to ask of anyone. Like <laughs> this book needs to be read twice. But you know, if it does, <laughs> it's only two hundred pages long, so you can do it. <laughs> there are there are so many um, sort of big and important themes that the book touches on. Um, obviously, one of the most important ones is is a sense of mortality uh, and death. Uh, for to, to give a quick sort of pricey for for people who are wondering what happens, we have a a central character Finn who um, goes to visit his brother who is dying in a hospice, and whilst he's there, receives the news that a, an ex girlfriend of his has committed suicide, and so he goes to visit her grave and in a step away from your usual realism in the novel form, he meets her at this grave and they go on something akin to a road trip um, together with her body slowly decomposing. And it, it's an extraordinary uh, book in many ways um, because of that, because there is this sort of very tender love, uh, but also frank and humorous exchange between the two of them. And this sort of rather bizarre feeling of not quite not being sure exactly what's going on because is she alive is she dead is it all in his mind etc cetera, etc cetera. we're back in the bardo which is something a word i'd never heard of before george saunders oh, lincoln in the bardo yeah. but now i feel yeah. like i've read a few books where it seems to have happened yeah where where, where did finn's story begin from you know you, you said you wanted to start with these letters but where did this idea of of him and uh lily having this sort of final goodbye come from i basically was thinking about, I mean, I was thinking about how unacceptable it is when people you love die and how you, the different ways you try to keep them close and the different pieces of denial you go into. Mm. Um, and then I was thinking about different times in history where, and for instance, the, the John Wilkes Booth component um, is there where people ref there, there are some legitimate theories that he that he did not die the way the official story went but also there were many many sightings of him and mm -hmm. people pretending to still be him after the assassination and after his ostensible death um, and so there was a desire in the confederacy to keep him alive or people wanted to be him why he was just so horrible but that's that was the confederate sentimentality and their their horrible cause um but so i thought this this idea exists historically it also exists very personally 
the the innkeeper from 1870-71 who's writing the letters has lost her sister and so she's still talking to her sister mm. i don't know if you've ever had this happen i just heard someone on the radio talking about a friend of his who was murdered and he just kept writing writing them emails mm. um and i've done that too mm someone who's died I, and and because I've found their email address and I thought I wonder if it still works and so I get on the email and I, I say hi I've been thinking about you and one time I actually sent one and and his his wife got it and said oh I totally understand I do this all the time keep writing so there is this way of just not being able to allow someone to disappear and it's also so mind-boggling death. Um, and so I wanted Finn and Lily's situation to be ambiguous. Perhaps they had buried her too soon. Perhaps she perhaps it's a climate change novel. Mm. And and she's thought out and she's she's back. Um, all these things are referenced. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but I think we, it, there's no, it's hard to talk about this novel without giving it all away. Mm. Um, so that's where it came from, this sort of the, and so it's also about grief and that the, all of this, this way of keeping the dead alive is, a, is obviously a form of mourning, a form of grief, a form of sort of not working through it, mm. um, not accepting the death, but, but adding adding something to your mind and imagination that allows you to sort of feel like well maybe this person just took a trip to australia or something and they'll be back soon <laughs> <laughs> um you know because i'm getting to that age where i mean even when you're young you know people who have died but as you get older you know you start to know a lot of people who have mm. died it's so unacceptable <laughs> It's Outright. just unacceptable. <laughs> um, that's sort of what was on my mind. Like, and, and uh, you know, ghost stories are, have a great tradition in mm. literature, both in British literature and American literature, um, and Irish literature. And um, so I, I, and I used to find myself telling, telling my students that they needed to put a ghost in their stories when they were stuck. I said, just. <laughs> Put a ghost in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I thought, well, I'll take my own advice. Yeah. But is she a ghost? That's that's the thing. She might really not be. She might just be a climate change figure. <laughs> well, she, she feels might... very, very corporeal, very real in the book because of your extraordinary descriptions of a, a body which is, as I say, slowly decomposing, and the care with which you have taken to sort of describe the skin and the hair and the smell and all the rest of it is is a akin to this the kind of attention that you'd expect to find in a shakespearean sonnet describing something of great beauty i'm going to i'm going to have afraid i'm going to quote you because there's a scene where he's bathing lily and i have a particular soft spot for scenes of bathing because i i don't know why i find them incredibly touching because it seems to me a very sort of intimate thing that you can do to somebody and you say she was now as sheer as the rice wrap on a spring roll the bean sprouts and chopped purple cabbage visible inside her which is like both tender and heartbreaking and disgusting at the same time <laughs> You must have taken so much care over phrases like that, but it seems to me that's just sort of typical of, of your approach to writing, which is that you're very careful about the words that you choose th throughout your writing. Well, I suppose we can never look at spring rolls again quite the <laughs> same way. But I obviously looked at a spring roll once and I thought, oh, yeah, I'll bet this is what she looked like. I was making it all up. Yeah. Um, but I had it so much on my mind that a lot of things I looked up out at in the world made me think oh yeah i'll bet this is what it would seem like mm. what she would look like and she's and she's she's not going in the right direction as as time moves 
through the novel. I mean, it's really only about 36 hours. I think they're together. I don't didn't actually count them, but hmm. um, but yeah, she's she's receding and becoming more um, more dead than she than she is when she first appears. I I suppose it's a way also for him to accept both to have a sort of final conversation with her and a connection with her and also to accept her her demise which in the end in the novel he doesn't really do no one of the other uh, concerns uh, i suppose is is about memory you've spoken about that sort of that inability to let people go which is why the, the the letters are somebody writing to a to a sister who has already passed away and of course um Finn's inability to let go of Lily there's a brilliant description you have of of photographs in the book um again one of these lines I, I keep finding people are always quoting lines of yours because they seem to be the sort of the perfect way of describing something and this struck me as very profound I'm afraid which was photos weak lies at the time but full of truth and power later on a weird form of time travel. Can you tell me a little bit more about this idea of what that means? That that at the time of taking a photograph, they're one thing, but then of course at the time of looking back on them much later, they become something else entirely. Right. At the time they're being taken, they're sort of fake. Hmm. And then later on, they they still may be fake in a different way, but they but we treat them very differently. We don't we treat them as somehow as having captured something true mm. um but you know everybody's standing in front and posing and you know and hiding their true feelings that's not but then we then we pretend the photograph itself is the true feeling and and you once felt this way that you looked in the photo or they looked or the people had this kind of relationship that the photograph suggests but I also contrast that with the with the 19th century photos, which took much longer to take. And so everybody looks a little grim. And that those perhaps contain the truth of, of their existence right from the beginning and straight on into, you know, eternity. Because, you know, you look at those pictures 150 years later and nobody looks happy. <laughs> Because they had to stand there for 20 minutes, I think, while the photographer did his work. So I wonder, it's interesting, isn't it, to think about photographs now? Because, of course, very seldom do people actually have hard copies of photographs anymore. They're so busy. Yeah. You, you take a photograph, you look at it instantly on your phone, and then you forget about it until you have to clear some storage space somewhere and you have to decide which yeah. ones to keep. Is that a bit of a shame, do you think, about you know our relationship with those images? I don't know. I don't know if it's a shame. It's it's certainly new and different and and you know, it's it's a shock to me who grew up in a particular I mean, photography has changed so much. I mean, when I was a kid polaroids were invented or at least polaroids were invented for routine consumer use and mm. they seemed fantastic. Mm. You know, that you could take a picture and then you could wait 30, I think you had to wait a minute and then you peeled off the thing. You remember, you, I, you're much younger than I am, so <laughs> I, you probably don't remember these things. Uh, but they seemed like magic. Yeah. And of course, now everything seems like magic, but it's also, um, it, it, it's it's mind boggling, I think. Mm. Uh, um and you know, I hope it. I hope we. It's good for the environment, but the environment is suffering so much that I don't know that having everything, you know, electronically is going to save it. Mm. You no, know, supposedly we use just as much paper with computers, um, but as for photographs, you know, it, the whole photo album and actual physical photo album with photos in it used to be you know really a kind of fun thing it's so antique now mm. and they have something called photo album on your computers where you can make you know a photo album but then 
And everyone's always holding out their cell phones and saying, look at this and showing you their kids and showing you this and showing you their meals that they ate. You know, I don't know. It's just, it's gotten a little crazy. It definitely is crazy. So things are photographed more than they used to be. I do think as well that there is definitely a difference. So we we made the effort to put some photographs in an album and uh, it makes a huge difference to how you interact with them. I think and it's it's quite similar to me to the feeling of, of reading a book on a sort of e-reader and then actually having the physical copy. There's a completely different relationship you have with that text or the picture in this case. And there's a lot to be said for the tactility of being able to have something in your hand and to to flick through it rather than... And is it more shareable in a way? Because when, you know, only one person can look at a screen at Mm. a time, but with the album open, you can sit on a sofa, you can look at things together. Mm -hmm. It's a little more shareable in that way, don't you think? Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I'm going to move us on to to (laughs) the idea of art now, because um, there's a... Lily's voice throughout the book is is so sardonic and and funny and uh there's one point where she says you think you can be the artist of your own death but surprise you can't even be the artist of your own art it always turns out crappier than you planned I can imagine many writers having that thought in their head how do you feel about your art um is do you many writers talk about the fact that you could keep working on any piece of writing forever you just have to choose the point at which you just sort of say okay that's that and and send it out how how do you feel about your art and do you ever feel that it turns out to quote Lily crappier than you planned oh it always does for everybody I think you know you have this idea of your novel being here and then you write it and it kind of ends up over there you know so there's a gap Mm. but you walk around with it in your head and in your head it's perfect (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not done it's not actually been put into the words that it needs to hold it and to convey it but it's all kind of a mind movie that you're walking around with and then you have to actually do the harder work of it and it ends up slightly to one side of where you wanted it to be and there but that's how it to some extent that's how it should be there should be some surprises hopefully the surprises will not all be bad ones so there will be some good ones some things that happen that you hadn't planned that's good Mm. because if there are no surprises for the author there are no surprises for the reader Mm. um a reader can feel that something's too planned out and it won't it won't surprise them either so um so surprises can be good um i think at some point the energies of the story you're telling start to i mean i could tinker forever and in Mm -hmm. fact there are a couple of mistakes already that i've found that i will change for the paperback don't tell my publishers they'll be so annoyed (laughs) um just tiny little things um (laughs) But you have to, if you can feel the energy sort of going away um, and things kind of settling in and the changes that you're making are no longer, I mean, if you make changes and then you wake up the next morning and change the changes, perhaps you're done. Mm. You know, you're just, you know, you're not, you're not moving the book forward. Also, if you start getting ideas for new books, if you really are moving on to the next project, um, it's time to close close it up. Mm. But I mean, novels take years. Um, they're they're it's interest. They're interesting years when you're working on a novel, and I don't know. I I I have a lot. I mean, Finn has as a high school teacher has a lot of things on his mind that he just kind of spouts off. Um, but mostly it's a love story or a kind of love story. What I, it, To me, it's a love story. Oh, it feels very much like a love story. And in fact, I suppose at the end of the book, I was really struck by, there's a romanticism, I suppose, about it. And um, you, there's a line where you, you talk about how you, if you lose your heart, um, 
the, the brain will die. Um, and if you lose your brain, the heart will die, but only eventually. A million love stories have demonstrated it. And, and so this very much is a love story, isn't it? About that, the persistence of love, even in this very strange relationship between Finn and Lily, right. um, which has right. not been a, a great one by all accounts. No, by their own accounts. <laughs> but they're they're sort of helpless you know they're they're just helpless especially finn he's just helpless within it um and he's a little angry there's some there's some anger but there's some love too and and so that's i think that's rather true to to love stories um and he you know he leaves his dying brother to sort of be with her because that's that's the way stupid love can work <laughs> um it's a bit of a theme in all my novels that and i didn't realize it till i finished this book that that the main character has a kind of fantastic infatuation that isn't based that much in reality and <laughs> turns her are his now in, in this one it's his but in, in the others it's her back on a sibling mm. so they all have that a little to some tiny extent They're, it's all differently expressed but it must be my sense of of it's my sense of wanting to tell a kind of love story but also to sort of um say love may not be the most important i mean romantic love may not mm. be the most important thing we're here to experience mm. in, in life it just it, it it happens to us but it may not be the the best thing but it, it's you're helpless before it because there it is yeah there's nothing you can do about that <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> Let, let readers take that with them as they close the final page of this book. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's about it's about romantic love persisting. But, it, you know, it, is that a good thing? Probably <laughs> not. Probably not. We should be more objective, but we're not. I look so. forward to seeing these sentiments in a Valentine's Day card sometime in the future. Romantic love persists, but should it... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um oh I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm old now, so I just I, I'm but I think I was always, even as a young person, very skeptical about it. <laughs> but who cannot be skeptical about it? Right? I think that's fair enough. I mean Alice Monroe was skeptical about it from the I mean that's her big subject. Hmm being skeptical about romantic love mm. but seeing it as a force in life and that it, there, I mean really there's nothing truer and it presents a lot of different kinds of stories when you when you look at it mm. um, I'm afraid Laurie that because we're recording this on zoom it's done that awful thing well it's a great thing when you're in a meeting at work and it tells you that you've only got uh, a limited amount of time left but it's bad for us because I would love to continue talking to you but... oh, thank you for your interest thank you for you know doing this I really appreciate it oh it's well, the pleasure is all mine Laurie it was really great to speak to you about this and, and thank you thank you so much for your time okay thank you I am homeless if this is not my home by Laurie Moore is out now <laughs>